Thank you very much. So these are uh, my disclosures. I'm also a certified executive coach, and those are my socks. So we've already heard this, but I think some of the things we'll talk about bring a lot of this home. But as surgeons, we are elite athletes. Think about what we have in common with these people pictured here. So we have a very specific and highly developed skill set that we hone over years and years of practice. We have to continually maintain and improve that skill set. We have to perform oftentimes under intense pressure. In our worlds, our numbers drive everything, whether that's RVUs or how long it takes us to do whatever, and there's brutal accountability to that. And just like athletes, often last year's records become this year's baseline. And really taking care of our bodies and our minds is taking care of business. Because as Dr. Jujarian said earlier, if we get sick, we're out of the game. So if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of anyone. What we do requires this moment to moment laser focus to excel at what we do. And when we don't take care of ourselves and we can't do that optimally, it impacts our patients, our colleagues, friends, our institutions. Just like with athletes, our technology is constantly changing, so we have to continually learn. We have to continually expand our current abilities to stay in the game. And without the right energy, achieving these performance goals may be impossible. So I think, like any other athlete, to achieve that optimal performance, we have to fuel our bodies appropriately. We have to train. We have to train both our technical skills as well as our sharpening our mental game, which has been the topic of a lot of the talks that we've had so far, and we need to rest and recover. And I really think for surgeons, there's a, what I call an energy crisis. So unlike a professional athlete who works four to five hours a day and has a career span of about seven to 10 years, we work about 10 to 15 hours a day, and our career spans more than 30 years. And then if you really look at it, our capacity to do this kind of work increases until we're about 30. And then it starts to decrease. And for professional athletes, that might work just fine. But for us, our workload doesn't decrease after we turn 30. You know, this is really in the heart of our careers, right when we finish training. So we start out with an energy crisis and an energy deficit. And so I think about nutrition for performance. I think about this when I'm doing athletic things. And, and I kind of simplify things. So my patients always ask me after a Whipple, they're like, well, what am I allowed to have? I'm like, you know what? Life's too short to never eat ice cream. <laughs> so I think I put things in two categories, need foods and want foods. So those need foods meet my physiologic requirements. So they help fuel my body when I want to run a half marathon or I need to stand in the operating room for six hours. They provide significant nutrients at low calorie density. And then there's the want foods. These are things that meet my emotional my social and my psychological needs. And I don't say that we should eliminate those, and I kind of follow what I call the 80-20 rule. So 80% of my diet is those need foods, and then 20% is those want foods. And if you think about it like that, you know, you don't have to eliminate anything, and I, you can do it however you want. You know, sometimes I have something with every meal, just a little bit of a want food, or, or just a snack a day, or, or if I'm gonna go to some big event, I save it for the week. But in, in general, I just try to keep this ratio and eat a balanced diet, because life is too short to eliminate anything. But I think our major problem as surgeons has to do with supply and demand. So this is a kind of a diagram of my supply and demand on my typical day in the operating room. And it looks way different on a day when I fly to Denver, and it looks way different on a day where I have an administrative day. But in general, I get up at four in the morning, and I exercise. I don't eat before I exercise because it's basically the middle of the night and I'm not hungry at like 3.30 in the morning. So already I'm at a deficit. You know, I'm running and I'm not being able to perform optimally. Then I'm rushing to get ready. So I get in the car and I make less than good choices and I eat something on my way to work and then I go to the operating room. And then I'll do a six hour case, a four hour case, however long, but during that time I don't eat and I get irritable, cranky, yelling at the resident by the end of the case. And then when I get out, I'm starving. So now I eat a snack, then I go back to my office and I try to answer email, but now I feel sluggish and nasty. And then I go home and I eat more dinner than I should and I sit and play with the dogs. And then somehow I need a snack before I go to bed. So now I've eaten all this food and now I go to sleep. 
So on my general day, my supply doesn't meet my demand. I know, it's pretty pathetic. But when you know, the demand exceeds the supply, we get lightheaded, we get fatigued, we get shaky and frustrated. And I really do feel that, you know, I'll, I'll do a long case and I feel myself just getting impatient and frustrated. I just wanna finish and I'm hangry. And then when supply exceeds demand, you know, we do have low energy, we feel fatigued, we feel sluggish, it reduces our productivity, we're less motivated. And so how do we make that match? So I try to make just little changes, and if we're really aware of these things and make small changes in the day, we can do better. So I buy things like little cups of applesauce or just a couple of crackers. I don't have to eat a whole meal at 3.30 in the morning. But if I just eat a little something, that run is a whole lot better. I try to plan my breakfast so that I'm actually eating something balanced that has a good glycemic index that lasts me for a couple of hours when I'm in the operating room. And in the operating room, as part of my timeout, I tell the whole team, like, hey, look, after I take out the specimen in my Whipple, I'm gonna scrub out for 10 minutes, I'm gonna go get something to eat, then I have the residents scrub out for 10 minutes and they get something to eat and I try to do as much as I can before they come back. But, the, <laughs> but it just makes like the reconstruction so much nicer and, and, and I'll find myself not wanting to do that, but I have that accountability. Then when I come out, I'm not as hungry. You know, I try to plan better dinners. I don't eat a snack unless I go and exercise at night or, or do something different. But I just try to match that supply and demand all the time. Things I just recommend, eat within an hour of waking. I know a lot of people are not breakfast people, but we have very long days. It helps to eat. Don't go more than four hours without eating. Our days are long. Eat within two hours of exercise before and after. Caffeine can make you feel like you have energy, even without, even with inadequate glucose. I can't really talk about that because I have not mastered that. I drink caffeine all the time. You can interpret that how you want. <laughs> um, hydrate. And then have strategic snacking. So I always have things in my office that I can eat you know, when I feel that energy get low. And I think you brought this up before too, Dr. Jerry, but I talk about strategic movement. So we do a lot of things where we are not moving, whether that's sitting at our desk all day or standing in one place in the operating room. You shouldn't really go more than two hours without moving. So I do this in the operating room too, and she talked about micro breaks, but this is really just a second. You don't have to take 10 minutes and scrub out, but it's like stepping away from the table, standing up straight, it's squatting, you know, flexing your knees, because I'm short, I'm bent way over, straightening your back and your neck. I actually do it for the whole team, um, so they kind of get used to me doing that, and it actually helps them also. If I'm sitting at my desk all day, I set my alarm to make sure that I get up, I don't get too absorbed in what I'm doing, but I, you know, walk, go up and down the stairs, whatever I need to do. And then I think about exercise, and I think, you know, for surgeons, it can be hard uh, to fit exercise into our schedule, but we have to make it a priority. It has to be safe, effective, and efficient. It should include flexibility, resistance, and aerobic training. I love aerobic things, but I totally hate strength training. But when I only do the aerobic stuff, I get hurt. So you need all these different aspects of it. And these are some things I've learned. So some is better than none. As surgeons, we often have this like all or nothing mentality. So I used to schedule my workouts like 100 years in advance on my calendar. And if I was supposed to run 90 minutes today and I didn't have time and I could only run 30, it was like this pass-fail thing. I'm like, well, then why even bother? But it's better to run 30 minutes than to not run at all. Um, and I've really sort of changed my focus and, and the way that I do that. If I can only do 20 minutes, if I can only do 10 minutes, whatever that looks like, it's better than doing nothing at all. I've also realized that it's sometimes quality and not quantity of how long I can do it. And I look for maximal improvement in a minimal amount of time. So there's a couple things. You can work these things into your day-to-day -day life, but if you only have a limited amount of time, high-intensity interval training, and it can be in all different formats, is good. So this is where you just have periods where you're working really hard and periods where you're in your relative comfort zone. So instead of walking for 30 minutes, you walk and you intersperse intervals of running, or you run and you intersperse interval intervals when you're running faster. You can do it in any sport. You can alternate flexibility training with these high-intensity cardiac intervals, but there's actually data that shows that when you do high-intensity interval training, that your calorie burn and stuff is actually last longer. And you can work this stuff into your everyday. So, 
you know, if you just go to work and you say, I can't exercise, and you just take the stairs every time you go somewhere. I counted the other day just because I was giving this talk, and on a day when I didn't even walk around that much, I did 70 flights of stairs. So that's just nothing. This is an app that you can put on your phone. It's a seven-minute workout. You can do it anywhere without any equipment. It gets your heart rate up really high. works your entire body in seven minutes. I give this to the residents. This is a resistance band workout. You can carry resistance bands in your pocket, and they have all different strengths, so you can get harder as, as you get stronger, but you can carry it in your pocket, and you can literally do a whole body workout. I'm happy to share this with anybody, but you can do it in the call room. You can do it while they're waiting to turn over your room, but you can work your arms, your legs, your core, everything uh, without hardly any equipment. And you need to rest and recover, you know, so we sort of talked about stress, and I don't pretend to have the solution to this. Um, I have a 25-year sleep deficit, and, I, you know, I, I make very, very small gains, but if we don't rest and recover, we don't get better. So when you think about athletes, they stress their body, but then their gains come when they rest and recover, and we have to do that. I have noticed that as I get older, I actually need more sleep than I used to need. I still don't get enough, but these are just some tips for, you know, bedtime rituals, going to bed the same time every night, not drinking caffeine before you go to bed, although I can drink it while I'm sleeping, and I can still do that. But we do have to work on optimizing our sleep when we have it. My superpower is that I can fall asleep anytime, anyplace. You also mentioned this, Dr. Labarra says that, you know, stress is necessary for, for growth, but too much stress, and when we're there all the time, leads to burnout. And so I really, my last piece of thought is like to actually do the things in your life that bring you joy. When I work with clients who are burned out, they often can't even remember the things that they like to do. They've eliminated all these things from their life. And these are just a few of the things that are bringing joy to my life right now. You know, I love to run. This is a picture of my patio at sunset in Tucson. I love to just sit out on the patio with my dogs and my husband, even for five or 10 minutes, and it just brings me peace and joy, and it adds time to my day. On the other side is my dog, Winston. He's a four-year-old golden doodle. He's my sole dog, and I started volunteering him as a therapy dog. And I bring him to work, and, and the staff, and the nurses, and the doctors, everybody's so stressed, and he just, um, he just brings so much joy to people around him. It brings him joy because he loves attention and it brings me joy. So do the things that bring you joy. And so just in summary, you know, we are elite athletes. We have to take care of ourselves like elite athletes. We have to prioritize ourselves or we can't take care of anyone. We need to take care of our bodies. We need to fuel. We need to train our surgical skills. We need to train our mental skills. And we need to rest and recover. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Dimitrios Stefanidis. He's gonna talk about sports psychology and performance optimization in surgery and high stress situations. Thank you.